our desire to believe that America is just and fair and has made so much progress since, you know, pick a tragedy, any tragedy, right? That we're just so committed to that story that we just will not allow ourselves to see the truth until it happens in a way that cannot be avoided and is usually really bloody and nasty. And even then we move on after a couple days. Hello, welcome to the Ezra Klein Show on the Vox Media Podcast Network. Let's begin with some exciting housekeeping, which I know are not two words that normally go together. Vox, with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation, is launching a vertical, a section, I guess, to be more normal about it, that will cover the world through the lens of effective altruism. Uh, If that doesn't mean a lot to you, then let me say it this way. We're launching a section dedicated to the question of how can we, humans, Reduce the most suffering for the most beings at the least cost based on the best evidence. We're going to be covering things like extinction level risks and poverty eradication and human development and climate change and and animal suffering. Um, These are the big, big issues. I don't think I've been as excited about anything in a very long time. Uh, I've been very, very, very eager to see this happen. And we're hiring for it. We're looking for staff writers, for an engagement manager. If that sounds like you, if you have experience writing about these issues or or building community around them, please apply. Go to voxmedia.com, click on the careers tab. Again, it is voxmedia.com and click on the careers tab. Okay. The podcast, the reason you are here. (laughs) I am really excited about the show, unusually excited about the show. Uh, It's a conversation on the topic that I'm most obsessed with right now, the one that I think explains almost everything else going on in American politics. And so I want to set the table a little bit. We are on the verge of some very big turning points in this country. According to demographers, more infants are now non-white than white. Uh, America is on track to become a majority minority country racially by about 2045. And do you want to hear uh, an amazing statistic on this one that's really stuck in my head? The most common age for white Americans is 58. For Asians, it's 29. For African Americans, it's 27. For Hispanics, it is 11 years old. We're about to have a record percentage of foreign-born Americans in this country. The fastest-growing religious group in America are are folks who don't identify with any particular religion at all. They're projected to become more numerous than white Protestants in the coming decades. So these are big changes. These are big changes in who has power, in who we see around us, in what it means when we're talking about the composition of this country. And it's easy to think of them just as numbers on a chart— But that's not how it's experienced. It's experienced everywhere around us. It's when you hear press one for Spanish. It's how we had the first African-American president, who, it should be said, lost the white vote in both of his elections. America's changing demographics. They're changing who's star on our TV shows, who you see on the bus, whose issues are taken seriously in politics, what people feel they can and can't say. I always think about this. It is no accident that the catchword for Barack Obama's presidency and the coalition that elected him, the word that powered his campaign, that excited his base, was change, was things will be different. And it's no accident the emotion that powered Trump, the candidate that followed him, the idea that connected Donald Trump to his coalition was nostalgia. Make America great again. Make it what it was again. Here's my contention. You cannot understand the political fights in America right now, from the wars over campus political correctness to Donald Trump's presidency to the politics of immigration, without understanding these underlying demographic changes and how they act on us psychologically. And to understand these changes, you need to talk to Yale psychologist Jennifer Richardson. She has done the pioneering work on how the feeling of demographic threat, how just being reminded that American demographics are changing, how that changes people's perceptions of themselves and their groups and politics at large. And she's done a lot of deep thinking on how to disarm that feeling of threat, how to talk about these questions and issues so that fear isn't the first thing people experience when they hear about it. Because if our politics are just going to be fear, fear, fear for the coming decades, it's going to be an ugly time in America. I believe, truly, this is one of the most important conversations I've had on this podcast if you're trying to understand America today. And I know that it is just the start of trying to understand this issue. So here is Jennifer Richardson. Jennifer Richardson, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. So I've wanted to have this conversation for for a while because you have done the work on what I think of as the most important contextual force driving American politics right now, but but one that we don't really recognize, which is what is happening to people's political opinions and their political identities 
amidst the amount of demographic and racial change that this country is going through. And so I wanted to start there. What have you found happens to people's politics when they feel that their identity group is losing power? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, surprisingly, we've been looking at this for for some time. And actually, we didn't start this work trying to understand political identity. I'm a social psychologist. I primarily study— My favorite kind of psychologist. (laughs) Mine, too. I I primarily study uh, race and racism, discrimination. And I was doing work um, really just to understand how narratives about our our diversifying country might shape people's racial attitudes. There had been a rhetoric around because the country is diversifying or becoming so-called majority-minority, it's going to become more tolerant or it's going to have to be in terms of racial attitudes. And when I— kept hearing this being, you know, sort of spouted out somewhat uncritically. Of course, I'm a skeptic. I am a scientist. (laughs) I wanted to see the data. And so, you know, I started doing studies to test how people are responding. And indeed, we found evidence that actually when people are exposed to these narratives of a so-called majority-minority shift, wherein white Americans are going to become less than 50 percent of the population, they largely express more negative racial attitudes and What was surprising, that wasn't surprising. So that was counter to what people thought. But what was surprising, and we actually stumbled upon relatively accidentally, is that we also found a relative shift to the right in terms of political attitudes, endorsement of political candidates and parties. And this is the side that kind of really just foisted me into political psychology, which has become my second favorite type of psychology, (laughs) and I think is really kind of become the pulse of where we are right now as a nation. And somewhat, you know, this undercurrent has been there, but it hasn't really come out into the forefront. And that's where we are right now. So I want to say this is a framing point for this conversation. To me, this idea of the undercurrent has been there and it hasn't come out to the forefront, I I both think is true and it's false in in the Mm -hmm. sense that I think it is out in the forefront, but we are not making the connection. Um, and this is something I'll, I'll try to argue sort of as we as we talk this through. But I think a lot of the the political debates, the political movements, the candidates, the the conversations we're having are related to this demographic shift we're going through, but we don't connect them back. So we have this quality of rushing from thing to thing to thing and seeing each one as separate or you know maybe linked to others, but 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 not as part of a cohesive whole. And one of the the things I think is going to be hard is if we never begin to see the whole picture here, because then we're never going to be able to try to address some of the root causes and fears. So maybe a place to start is, can you describe the experiment you and your colleagues did where you provided people information about majority-minority futures and some people not that information and, and looked at what happened? I'd like people to get a sense of how these this information is being gathered. Sure. And and I should say, I agree with you wholeheartedly that this is the story and we haven't been connecting the dots. Um, but yeah, so we started um, quite a while ago now, probably 2010, maybe uh, even a little earlier, really trying to get a sense of what happens if we just isolate people, you know, sort of make this information about demographic change salient and then ask them about a variety of attitudes racial attitudes, political attitudes. So what we do is we, you know, select a sample of a convenient sample, just, you know, regular people, often online. Sometimes we bring them in um, to our lab and we randomly assign them to be exposed to a news article, something that they would see on CNN.com or, you know, in the the Washington Post or even now on TV uh, that talks about the demographics of the nation and how they're changing. And importantly, we, we didn't create any false information. We presented exactly the type of information, if not the exact information that is available and, you know, just presented all the time in these reports. And it's all taken from the U.S. Census Bureau. They actually created the first of these reports that then got um, reported by any number of press outlets, including the AP, which I think is one of the first ones we used. And we either presented this information or across a bunch of studies, a variety of control articles. So either something very similar, similar tone, similar language, similar presentation that just talked about the current demographics of the nation, and we're largely talking racial demographics here, 
or sometimes it would be other types of generic non-race-related information, so how the country is aging, especially if we were doing our studies in young adults, college students, to see if this is some generalized response to finding out that some group that's not your own is getting bigger. Sometimes it was a similar article about racial demographic changes in a different country. So we used the Netherlands, which actually is indeed having a similar demographic shift. Many European countries are. Um, the the names of the groups slightly differ, but the dynamics are similar. So what we were doing is trying to really, you know, create a number of strong, rigorous experimental tests of if I show you this information about the changing racial demographics of the nation, this so-called majority minority shift or white minority condition, it's often called, compared to or instead of some other what would, is our control information, but race-related often information that doesn't trigger or activate or make salient this shift, what will happen? And time after time, both our group and many other groups now have found that this racial shift information, when making that salient, engenders the expression of more negative racial attitudes towards a large swath of racial groups on both self-report, you know, people just report, yes, I don't like this group as much, or I prefer to hang out with my own group. And again, these are largely white American samples, often exclusively white American samples. So this is, you know, when your group is feeling like it's lowering in numbers compared to control. But we also see what we call conservative shift, just a slight, not always, you know, huge. We're not talking about people, you know, running out and changing their voter registration or anything. But self-reported support for Republicans, the Republican Party goes up, warmth for the Republican Party goes up. People understanding themselves is more conservative. And which I thought was the most remarkable and surprising is that people actually endorse the Republican or the conservative position on a number of policies more after exposure to this majority minority shift information compared to control. So it on race-related things, you know, which makes sense, but also on, you know, tax policy or whether we should drill in the Alaska wildlife refuge, right? I mean, things well, I know if I'm wouldn't. feeling a little threatened, the first thing I want to do is drill for oil in Alaska. <laughs> yes, <exactly. laughs> let, let me Let me um, summarize one of these studies back to you because I want yeah. to make sure I'm sure. saying it right, but I, but I also want to say for, for the audience. Yes, and that was long and really, sorry. No, no, that was super helpful. <laughs> yeah. So in, in one of these studies, you gave folks, you know, two of these different articles. And one of them spoke about California, which has become a uh, minority majority uh, racially some time ago, I believe. And mm -hmm. what I thought was so interesting about it was you saw the Republican shift in the people exposed to that article. And that's it. They just read this article. It's not a huge deal. I mean, you read a lot of articles right. in a day. Uh, it's not like somebody's like taking you aside and yelling at you in a room. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty mild cue. So you saw a conservative shift, but among white independents, uh, who, which is who the study was about, mm -hmm. who lived in the Western United States. So California is a more important – it's more part of their political geography too. The shift to the, towards the Republican Party against a control group was 11 points. That's right. That's big, right? Very little moves people's positions 11 points. I mean these were independents, so maybe they're a little bit easier That's to right. move. But that was a striking size of an effect to me. That's right. And to be fair, we did not design that study. We just analyzed the data from the, from the study for this purpose. And it wasn't designed to test this. And so there were a number of other differences between the people who heard about the majority minority shift versus those who heard about the current demographics of California. So we cannot, you know, make strong causal claims, which is why we did the experiments <laughs> that we did. Um, but yes, it's really compelling that for people perhaps who are most uncommitted to a party or to a position either at that moment or across time because circumstances change. I think our work and then the work of others suggest that there is a vulnerability to shifting party alignment or at least nudging a few points in either direction, but certainly the conservative direction, in response to what we call these sort of more social threats, right? Not physical threats, which we also know, actually, there's a good evidence in psychology also shifts people towards being more conservative um, and supporting more conservative leaders. But these are social threats, and they're actually, what's worse, imagined threats, because this narrative is largely false. <laughs> well, and we're going to get back to that, and, yeah. and we, yeah. we'll, we should also interrogate also the, the even the language of threat, 
right? That's right. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah, a Californian right. and the demographic change in my state does not feel like it has done any harm to me. And so I think it's that's interesting right. even the way we talk about this in, in, in public. But that's right. one thing that I think is important here, is this just something that happens to, to white people? Or if you remind, say, African-Americans of rising Hispanic numbers in, in America, do they show a similar reaction? Indeed, I'm glad you asked that because they do. This is not the psychology of white people. This is a, a basic group psychology when there are these concerns about the standing of your group, either in society or in whatever organization. We know reliably our field has shown, sociology has shown that people galvanize in defense of that group. And that's what we believe we're seeing and our data are consistent. So when you expose Asian Americans, Black Americans to similar articles about the growth in the Hispanic population, they too also show a shift towards more support for conservative policy positions, obviously not on the ones that are most group relevant, so not on affirmative action, for instance, for Black Americans, but on the more basic ones. And you see a shift towards, again, more warmth directed towards Republicans than compared to those in the control condition. And there's actually no change in support for Democrats, which is also interesting. So this really is about rethinking the relationship between the group, in this case, Blacks and Asian Americans, and the Republican Party or conservative policies. For decades, credit cards have been telling us to buy it now and pay for it later with interest. The point of that business model is that the interest can get out of control fast and then the lender makes more money. With Lending Club, you can consolidate your debt or pay off credit cards with one fixed monthly payment. Since 2007, Lending Club has helped millions of people regain control of their finances with affordable fixed rate personal loans. There are no trips to a bank, no high interest credit cards. You just go to LendingClub.com, tell them about yourself and how much you need to borrow. Pick the terms that are right for you. And if you're approved and if the terms make sense for you, your loan is automatically deposited into your bank account in as little as a few days. Lending Club is the number one peer-to-peer lending platform with over $35 billion in loans issued. So go to LendingClub.com slash EZRA. You can check your rate in minutes and borrow up to $40,000. That is LendingClub.com slash EZRA. Again, LendingClub.com slash EZRA. All loans are made by WebBank, an FDIC member, and an equal housing lender. I want to jump then from from the micro to the macro. You've written a, a fascinating piece about serving this research and serving what it might mean for American politics. And you, you and I think it was a colleague as well, right towards the end of it, I'm just going to read this as a quote, that although Trump's election was certainly determined by many factors, it was perhaps due in part to largely unrecognized at the time social and political dynamics stemming from the very demographic shifts that had previously engendered enthusiasm among Democrats and pessimism among Republicans, namely the increasing racial minority share of the national population. And, and what you're saying, there was a couple of years ago, Democrats were all excited that America was getting browner, it was getting more diverse, this was going to be so good for them politically. And then in 2016, it might have actually been the cause of their defeat. Feet. Make that case to me. When you say that, what is the story you're you're suggesting um, might have occurred? Yeah. So yeah, and I said this back in 2014 and got poo pooed. <laughs> <laughs> resoundedly. Well, look who's laughing um, now. That this, could, <laughs> that this could happen. I know. Well, I'm not laughing. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think the general post-2012 election, right, re-election of Obama, this sense of a lasting, persistent Obama coalition, supermajorities of racial groups, and then the rising demographics, right? The demographics is destiny story. We hear it all the time, right? So Democrats were doing a victory lap and saying, you know, you guys are dead. And actually, Republicans were pretty much saying the same thing. Um, I remember Lindsey Graham even said, and I think a quote in the Washington Post that, you know, they're not generating enough angry white guys to be viable as a party. I'm like, what? (laughs) So, you know, I think that that entire story, I think, was wrong. I think it misunderstood, one, that what just happened in 2012 uh, was in part a trigger for backlash, right? Not only re-electing a head of the state who was Black American, which we know other research by folks like Clara Wilkins suggests is a strong prime sort of of racial progress that actually people react against if they're unhappy about it, but also it maybe awakened in 
white Americans, maybe some of whom had been on the sidelines or who, again, have been kind of on the middle, could have gone either way, this sense that what it means to be American might be changing and or their say in what it means to be American might be receding, their share of the say. Each of those is a perceived threat to the status of the group. And we know, again, people respond to threats, even if they can't name it. It's like a sense of anxiety that the country is sort of going in a direction either that they're not in charge of or they don't quite know where it is. And that vulnerability, I think, is real. It's not imagined. And it happened to be coupled with a broad economic vulnerability. So I'm not one to do the economic anxiety versus this racial threat stuff. <laughs> I think they work together. But, you know, I think— Democrats missed it. It was it was more of a, um, well, we're going to have the numbers, so let's not even work to think about what the experience of this diversifying America might mean for white Americans, including white Democrats. You know, we just sort of said, well, they'll be outnumbered. We don't have to worry about it. And we still hear that. So there's a counter argument here, particularly mm-hmm. when it comes to these white Democrats who went over to Trump in, you know, the the, the Midwestern states, which is... If it's what you say it is, if it's a a sense of racial threat, if it's a sense of the country changing, well, then how did Barack Obama win two terms so easily? And how did he win some of these white Democrats who who Hillary Clinton won? Doesn't that disprove the whole thesis? It might. (laughs) I'm a (laughs) scientist. I'm open to being wrong. (laughs) So, yeah. No, I mean, I think it – so two things. One, we forget that time is happening. So, for instance, the people who are – experiencing this opportunity to elect the first black president, right, in a different state. The country's in a different state after that's done, that's happened, right? So there's that piece of it. There's also, you know, the people who probably weren't really thinking about what it might mean to have a first black president, at least those who might feel negatively about it or not so great about it. Maybe they didn't believe it would happen, And so for them, after it happens, then they get animated, right? Or at least they might be more open to being persuaded by white nationalists for whom having a black president is, you know, horrible, (laughs) right? Similarly, the demographic change was happening contemporaneously, right? So this is happening for everybody besides California and, you know, a few other states. It's happening during this time of the Obama years, right? It's just happening. These projections of a so-called majority-minority nation, the first one from the Census Bureau didn't come out until 2008, which is interesting, right? Why Why now? <laughs> but that's a whole other story, right? I'm not a conspiracy theorist, at least not about this. <laughs> so I think the very thing that gives rise to excitement, in some sense, the possibility of a Black president also gives rise to a counterforce, right? This Maybe this is the physics of, of political dynamism, right? It's a counterforce of, oh, no, we can't become a white minority country, right? They're the same force. They're just, you know, which side maybe is, you know, going to win out, I suppose. I, I do like that point about political dynamism mm-hmm. because I, I think about this a lot. Uh, I think about it in the 2016 election particularly, but, but, but going forward, I think it applies. So here's a, a model that I've been playing around with of what happened. So in 2008 and then in 2012, Obama runs against Republicans who, for reasons of their personal character or for reasons of their understanding of the electorate, they don't want to make race and demographics a big issue. Uh, John McCain, I think, did not want to have that fight with Barack Obama and and nor did Mitt Romney, actually. I mean, I remember us having debates in 2012 about these welfare reform ads Romney was running. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was there something deeply encoded in there and were they racist? But, you know, if they were, you sort of had to do an interpretation across a couple of levels. But overall, I think Mitt Romney wanted to run against Barack Obama as a – like Mitt Romney represented the entrepreneurial, managerial, capitalist class, and and Obama was you know for unions and and wanted to give people free stuff, and and they sort of agreed to have an economic argument, and and prior to that, you know, McCain and Obama sort of agreed to have an argument about change versus experience and and establishment, whatever. Like politicians do make decisions about which ideas and identities to activate, and Donald Trump starting during the Obama era when he he came to prominence as a birther, wanted to make the argument about the president's skin color and background. And I mean, he actually combined an argument about immigration 
and religion <laughs> and um, race, right? That's what birtherism managed to put all those things together. The idea was Barack Obama was not from here, did not look like you, and maybe didn't even have the same religion as you. And then he and Hillary Clinton, it always seemed to me, running in the aftermath of Obama, collided much more frontally on issues of demographics on, you know, from Donald Trump starting his uh, campaign around the wall and then calling for a shutdown of Muslim travel to the U.S. and talking about, you know, when America was great and using a, a lot of quite obviously coded language to Hillary Clinton talking about stronger together and implicit bias and, and making much more explicit appeals to the Obama coalition, talking about Black Lives Matter. It seemed to me that one of the after effects of Obama was a political context in which for different reasons, people were more likely to argue about race. And so we ended up activating a lot more of these racial feelings in people. So on the one hand, those were choices made. But on the other hand, if not for having had the first black president, I don't think we would have been in the place for for politicians making those choices to to catch such fire, right? I don't think Donald Trump, for instance, right. would have been so desired within the Republican Party if there wasn't, you know, those folks in the primary who who felt like something was not being said that needed to be said. And so there's a way to me in which this system is very dynamic. Um, as we have these demographic changes, as new people get elected to office, as new groups become powerful. It creates counter reactions and it creates new things that people want to argue about and new things that political entrepreneurs can ride to power if they're willing to pick up the live wire of that argument sitting out there on the floor, which a lot of people maybe want to have, but somebody has to let them have it. Does that that's make right. sense? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it was a choice to not do that. And and maybe this speaks well of John McCain, who was best positioned to do it. Once Obama was elected, it was a little bit unseemly. Although, to be fair, Mitt Romney did still cozy up to Donald Trump and recognized he needed that flank in some way. So there was never doused that negative racial story around Obama. Mm -hmm. and, and we know it was there throughout the campaign and it was there throughout his presidency, but in part because of his temperament and ways he didn't go all the way there. And, you know, we'll look back at this time maybe as a failure to acknowledge the straight racist energy that was bubbling up during the entire time. I mean, there were all these sort of stories about uh, not stories, right? Facts. <laughs> Obama's needing Secret Service protection way earlier than any other candidate. All of the threats that he got, right? All of this was happening. And I think polite society sort of didn't want to acknowledge it. And, you know, I think maybe these things are related. I, I guess they are. But, you know, in a different line of work, I talk about our sort of national willful blindness to the inequality that exists in the nation, especially the racial economic inequality. And I think this is another place where our desire to believe that America is just and fair and has made so much progress since, you know, pick a tragedy, any tragedy, right? That we're just so committed to that story that we just will not allow ourselves to see the truth until it happens in a way that cannot be avoided and is usually really bloody and nasty. And even then we move on after a couple of days. And then there's this issue of what other people are saying and, and what's being primed in the background. Because now mm -hmm. I think you can go back and, and tell the story. I mean, as you're saying, I think that one of the things that is easy to look at now is to look back at, say, the birther movement and say, I think people took that seriously, but they also mocked it. They also That's thought right. this is ridiculous. But, you know, in 2009, Rush Limbaugh uh, went on the air and he said, how do you get promoted in a Barack Obama administration by hating white people or even saying you mm -hmm. do or that they're not good or whatever? I'm still quoting him here. Making white people the new oppressed minority and they are going along with it because they're shutting up. They're moving to the back of the bus. They're saying, I can't use that drinking fountain, OK? I can't use that restroom, OK? That's the modern day Republican Party, the equivalent of the old South, the new oppressed minority. So like that's what the most popular talk radio host, probably any talk radio host, was telling his listeners. And then in 2012, on the eve of the election, Bill O'Reilly, who is the top rated cable news anchor, went on Fox News and said, because it's a changing country, the demographics are changing. It's not a traditional America anymore. You know, he said some other stuff. And then he finally says, whereby 20 years ago, President Obama would have been roundly defeated by an establishment candidate like Mitt Romney. The white establishment is now the minority. And so there's this way that in the background of these things, I'm not even sure it's fair to call O'Reilly and Limbaugh the background. Like Maybe they're the foreground. But, right. you know, there are the things that the president himself was saying. And I think Obama tried quite hard to de-escalate racial conflict, to, to comfort people about what he represented and, and, and where the country was going. But his existence 
led to a lot of other people, whether authentically feeling threatened and, and, and so coming out with those kinds of comments or just seeing that the sense of threat was out there and that there was a market for it. But it creates a different context. I mean, if, if it had been John Edwards who won the 2008 uh, presidential campaign. <laughs> I don't know. We'd be in good shape. Sure. We want to end up talking about something <laughs> something very, very different. But but using a stylized John Edwards, right? Or Joe yes. Biden had won the 2008 presidential campaign. That's right. These messages are not being sent. And this threat is not being activated. And so in 2016, there's just less of it there to, to pick up on. I 100 percent agree. And I think part of the problem is, right, it's, it was out there. It was in plain sight. It was on mainstream news, right? Bill O'Reilly. I mean, Hannity every day right now just talks about this minority status, this victim status of white America right now, right? And vis-a-vis -vis immigration or any number of policies. So it's out there. But I think... Part of the paradox of racial progress is that we want it so badly that these salient markers electing Barack Obama, well, we did that. And so almost where you started, doesn't that nullify all the evidence of racial discrimination against him and everyone else? It's like, well, no, it just it's a confluence of lots of things had to come together for that to happen. And it didn't just erase you know, all of the racial animus that had been out there, right? And the concern about group status. I mean, there was a nice paper that came out around 2000, maybe a little bit later, but it was about white Americans in Boston. This is Mike Norton's work and Sam Summers showing that although everyone agrees that racial discrimination against blacks was worse than that against whites back in the 50s and 60s, now in the 2000s, is white people, for the most part, think that racial discrimination against whites is worse, more prevalent than racial discrimination against blacks, right? That was out there, that finding. And that whites, on average, think that racism is a zero sum. So if it's not directed at, at you guys anymore, then it's going to be directed at us. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's not really how it works. You know, we can create justice and equality for everybody, but that's not how people think about it, right? And that's part of the problem, I think, although we don't have data on this, but the minority majority language, right? If we're no longer the majority, even though we're the most populous group, but somehow we're the minority the things that we imagine, assume, or know have happened or happened to minorities will happen to us. And who wants that? <laughs> that says a lot about American <laughs> history right there. So yeah, I, I no, want to hold right. on a, a stat you just mentioned because I, I sure. think this gets brought up a bunch and people just rush by it, but it, it's quite remarkable. So you mentioned polling, and this has been replicated a lot of different times, that a majority of white Americans now think – that discrimination, racial discrimination against white Americans is as bad or worse than it is against African Americans or, or Hispanics or Asians or whomever. And whenever I see that, I think there is a one tendency, and, and I certainly feel it, to, to react with, a, with outrage. But that can blind the fact that you need to figure out what is happening there. Because mm -hmm. if that is truly how a majority of the majority group feels, that is a very potent political force, right? That is that is That's something right. really sitting there waiting to be or currently actually being activated. That's and right. I think this is one of those things that people – they want to argue about it so much. They want to disprove it that I don't think people know even how to absorb it because like what would it mean to take that seriously? On the one hand, it is in my view a ridiculous view. But on the other hand, it is a view and it, it is a powerful one and it's affecting our politics. Oh, yeah. And I, I, don't, right. I don't see anybody with a plan for that one. <laughs> yes, I don't see anyone with a with a plan for that one, other than the people who are planning to leverage it. Right. Yes, yeah, so I guess that's right. Donald Trump does have a plan gains. on this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, Jeff Sessions has a plan, right? The Justice Department right now is has a plan to deal with it, in in you know suing Harvard, for instance, right? Uh, looking into these anti white discrimination claims or possibilities. So yeah, it is perplexing. I mean, I again, I think this is one where. I like to believe our we've shot ourselves in the foot by our narratives about racial discrimination and racial progress, right? Talking about the wins on our nation's trajectory, changing the law, for instance, Martin Luther King, right? Our very thin, happy, clean narrative of racial progress where very few people died. In fact, sometimes we forget that, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. He didn't just die, <laughs> right, for this. But our story about this is so foundational and compelling that on the one hand, it's, I think, largely left a generation of people my age, 
probably, and certainly younger, who believe all of this has been achieved. One, that was way in the past, not my mother's generation, right? My parents were the first generation of folks to integrate public schools, right? That's how young or old, depending on how old you think I am, <laughs> this is. But, you know, so the we're interviewer not, we're wise couple, stay silent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaning into middle age. It's okay. <laughs> are, are, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it hasn't been that long ago, yeah. right? People who are still alive. Yeah, it's my, it's my mother's, right? it's my mother's we're, generation. We're doing this. Exactly, right? They are the ones who bore the brunt of integration and fought for it. All of a sudden now we think, oh, the book is closed on that. That's happened and everything is fair and equal and just now. So it's just your individual talents and merit that matter. And so if we're even considering race, that is somehow racist, which of course is also not true. But also if we have to think about the ways in which racial discrimination currently persists and also the legacy of past you know, generations of racial discrimination, that just doesn't feel good, right? We don't like that. It's not consistent with our narrative about how, you know, how we literally have overcome right? That's where we want to be. And that means anybody who actually wants to make the white grievance sort of argument, you know, they are talking about race very proactively, very actively, very in an engaged way. And the people who are more liberal, more progressive, you know, especially white liberals, they just don't want to talk about it, right? They just like, well, that was bad, but now it's over, you know, and we all sort of know it's not really over, but let's not talk about it because, you know, that's uncomfortable, right? Well, if the only people who are talking are white nationalists, that's a problem. I want to pick up on something you said in there that relates to another study that I've been working my way through. So there was a research done a couple years ago, and I'm not going to remember the people's names off the top of my head, so I'm not going to do it that way. (laughs) Frankly, I might have found it through you. What they did was they exposed white college students to either a priming discussion about white privilege, right? Think about the ways in Uh which you as a, a white person have been privileged. Or a priming discussion about white disadvantage or just a priming discussion about, hey, remember some stuff from your past. How was your past? And what they found was that if you get white people thinking about the idea of white privilege, then in subsequent surveys show higher levels of of what researchers call modern racism, which I don't love Mm -hmm. that terminology, but but racial resentment, racial conservatism, whatever you want to call it. That's right. And so you had said a minute ago that being confronted with this past, being confronted with the idea of America having a racist past, of there being inequities that need to be corrected, that it doesn't make anybody feel good. And I think we often have that language with this language of white guilt. But Mm -hmm. it actually has this other thing, which is it creates a defensiveness. It creates a counter reaction. It creates a motivated reasoning in the other direction. Oh, no, actually, today, affirmative action and other things mean my group is the most disadvantaged or on these studies of of racial resentment. Oh, no, you know, that's just a story people are telling. In fact, the issue is that people are just making terrible choices and getting divorced and cultural pathology and whatever it might be. And so one of the things here that seems to me to be a very tricky dynamic, it's a dynamic I think is playing out on a lot of college campuses right now, is as traditionally disadvantaged groups get stronger numerically, politically, economically, they're able to force more of their issues and their own history and their experience to the conversation. But in doing that, the white majority, which feels itself shrinking, which feels itself losing some power, we like to think that the confronting people with that will make them less racist. It'll make them more egalitarian. It'll make them more thoughtful about the future. But it seems to actually have, in many cases, the opposite effect. It makes them more defensive. It makes them more identity protecting. It, it makes them, in order to protect their own idea of themselves and their group, come up with a counter narrative that increases their enmity towards towards a group that is challenging and threatening them. That seems like a very difficult thing to deal with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and all of that's true. I mean, I think. So I have a a simple answer and a not so simple answer. (laughs) The simple answer is lots of things that are good for us don't feel very good, (laughs) right? I've now recommitted to working out. I've been going to the gym a lot. It's horrible. I hate it. It's really good for me, (laughs) right? I feel the same way about diversity often. It's like, you know, it's really hard. You have to like pay attention to what other people think and their perceptions. And maybe we've got to change the arrangements of the university calendar or buildings or even big things like the calendar. So, you know, when my great story about this, not great, but when I like a lot, I was on the faculty at Dartmouth. And in order for Dartmouth to become co-ed, of course, it couldn't 
deny any of the 3,000 deserving men who surely would have otherwise gotten into Dartmouth. So what it did was it changed the entire calendar so they could admit 1,000 women have a class of 4,000. And they just, that's why they, Dartmouth, I don't know if you know about Dartmouth, but it has this sort of summer session that all the sophomores are enrolled in. And so then they're gone one other trimester, right? This entire thing was in order to enable Dartmouth to become co-ed, right? So this huge transformation of the college and its calendar, because we certainly cannot deny any deserving man in order to do this co-ed thing, right? Doing the right thing is hard. It's challenging. Sometimes we make rapid and huge changes in order to do the right thing. It almost never feels good. It's very disruptive in the moment. Over time, often it settles down once people decide this is what we're doing, this is how it's going to be, despite the acrimony, and they move forward. The racial case is complicated for any number of reasons, because I don't think the nation ever really agreed that this was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing to do because of social justice, as opposed to getting co-opted by the diversity message, which was like, well, it's good for white people's education to have all these other people around, (laughs) which is a different aim and a different sense of societal good, right? And it's probably less compelling, even though on the court, it was more compelling, at least people thought at the time. Oh, I think that's such an important point. So, so I want to I want to stay on this for a minute because mm-hmm. it it gets at something that in almost every conversation I have about this, people want to deny. What you just said, as I understand it, is that we've sometimes tried to elide this conversation by saying there are no hard choices to be made here. Everything is good for everybody. So, you know, the important thing about affirmative action is it actually makes the educational environment for for white people richer and more diverse. And that works until the first white person decides they were kept out of the university because that spot went to a less qualified non-white person than they Mm -hmm. are. And there are things here that are positive sum or neutral. And then there are questions that are zero sum or negative sum. There are questions about reparations. There's questions about inequality. There's questions about, you know, who gets spots. There's questions about I, – I always see this when, when quotas come up with the idea that if you're trying to get to a certain diversity number in an organization or on corporate boards, are you going to be hiring people who are not the best people because, of course, all the best people are the white men who have <laughs> – you know, but, but, but there is a right. sense in which the, the transition means less, right? If you are part of the group That's that right. has been winning from this for a very long time – the transition might numerically over time, or at least for some people for some time, mean less. And That's that right. isn't a discussion people want to have because they're very, very, very uncomfortable. And I think understandably so with the message that this could be zero sum or could mean some people end up getting less. In part because, one, it's just an uncomfortable conversation to have, and is that even fair for an individual to be on the hook for generational inequalities? But also because if you do that, the political backlash is going to be so immense and so quick that it might put you in a worse place than you started. And so you end up having this conversation that is – it's sort of denying what a lot of people know, which is that at least in some cases there is a zero-sumness. In some cases, choices do have to be made between two people or five people or something. But on the other hand – If you never have that conversation, how do you make progress on some of these harder and stickier economic issues in particular? Yeah, I I think that's right. It's a very hard problem. And I don't approach it as one that should be easy to solve. I mean, institutional structural arrangements that have systematically disadvantaged certain members of society and not others, and so therefore advantage certain members of society, they're hard to change. However, there can be the will to change those arrangements when it becomes untenable not to, right? It became untenable to stay single sex, right, for these elite universities to stay that way. It's actually, interestingly, currently untenable, at least for this one moment. We'll see if it sticks. But to stay so financially elite, right, having uh, a student body that is, you know, decidedly mostly the 1% or 5%, right, having very few low-income students, that right now we're in a political moment where that is unacceptable, you know, especially institutions that get public money, right? That's just unacceptable. But in order to change that, right, that means some people, the children of the elite, maybe, or maybe it'll be this middle class that gets squeezed out. I don't know. You know, it's interesting to see how this will play out. But in order to change that, assuming the student body does not increase the size, you'll have to change 
how the the calculus is done, right? I mean, and I, I think there are hard conversations, right? They really are. And we shouldn't pretend like they're not hard, but we should also not pretend that it's meritocracy versus diversity, right? The reality that for a hundred years or more, only the you know the first or second born son, maybe of the elite class, got to go to Harvard and Yale or wherever, right? As long as they're Protestant and landowning and white, and of course, and male, there's nothing mer- meritocratic about that, right? That's exactly not meritocracy. So let's not pretend that what has been so heretofore was this meritocracy, and now we're doing something different, right? The reality is. Any number of all of these, especially, you know, elite universities can populate their incoming class many times over with people who are qualified, exceptionally well qualified, and then trying to decide what the makeup of that class looks like. One of a number of factors is what's happening here. It's not, oh, there is some one marker for merit that, you know, we can just have that one number and just pick the people, <laughs> rank them in, on that number, and we'll cut it off at, you know, whatever number is how many we need to admit, and that it, that's it. Like, that's, that's never, that's not how it happens. That's not how it works. You know what's great about eating your favorite thing? It's your favorite thing, and you're eating it. Probably, if you're like me, you're eating it covered, covered in a scary way with sriracha. That's not a hard sell. If it weren't good, it wouldn't be your favorite thing. Problem is, it, it can be hard to get your favorite thing. The, the people who make your favorite thing, maybe they don't have delivery, or maybe their delivery van broke down. So there's something you want, but you end up settling for something you don't want. That sucks. It's 2018. We put a man on the moon. We can edit human DNA. You should be able to get the food you want delivered for lunch. Introducing Postmates, the app that adds a delivery option to your favorite restaurants. Imagine anything you want to eat delivered. You don't have to drive, park, or even talk on the phone to order. You just download the app and order 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They bring you what you want within the hour. You can even see where your food is and track your driver. And it's not just meals. You forget to pick up groceries, no problem. You craving ramen? Check. Looking for the perfect bottle of red wine or summer beer? Order up. For a limited time, Postmates is giving you $100, $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. So to begin your free deliveries, download the app today and use code EZRA100. That is code EZRA100 for $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days using Postmates. Save the hassle, get the food you love fast at Postmates with code EZRA100. This to me is also the context for the political correctness debates that we're having on, on different campuses. And, and I recognize these debates can drive into different places, but it really seems to me that a lot of those arguments, um, arguments about speech, about what you can say and not say, about microaggressions, about, about just aggressions, that we're having a discussion where these campuses, which are, are drawing out of a, a young population that is in, in incredibly diverse now. Uh, the I, I think the stat is so amazing. The average age of a white person in America is 57. The average age of an Asian, I believe, is 29 or 27. The mm-hmm. average age of an African-American is 29 or 27. And the average age of a Hispanic American is 11. So yeah. <laughs> when you look at the young, it's m- a much more diverse group than, than, right. than older generations. And so it seems to me that on a lot of campuses, you're having people say, hey, I I haven't actually liked how you've been talking about me for a long time. Like, I've not liked some of these things that don't seem like a big deal to you. They seem like a big deal to me. And everybody tries to spin it to their advantage. And so some people are saying it's a debate over free speech and what you can say. And others are saying it's a debate over racism. And others are saying it's a debate over whether or not something is even important. But it just seems to me that we're – as different groups gain numerical strength and power and representation – there is going to be a lot of disagreement about what is acceptable. How is it kind and reasonable to treat other people? And that we don't really have a great language for that. It's very threatening to everybody and nobody quite has the power to just say it's going to be this way. And so we just end up in this very conflictual space. But the more society diversifies, it seems to me, the more of those kinds of conflicts we're going to see. Yeah, ab- absolutely. You know, and I think something that you said, I think, gets lost in the conversation often, and that is, what does it mean to be kind and respectful in these spaces, right? That's not even part of the conversation, <laughs> because I think if it became part of the conversation, what does it mean to be kind and generous, both as a speaker and as a listener, 
in these conversations, we would actually realize there's a lot of agreement (laughs) about what people should say and how they should engage one another, not what you have the right to say and do. That's almost irrelevant, right? Yeah, of course you have the right to say all kinds of things without, you know, the state coming down on you, right? Which is what free speech protections (laughs) mean. But should you? And is that who you want to be? Is that how you want to be understood in this community? And I think that's part of the issue, I guess, getting back to where we started. One thing we know is that the strife, the discomfort, the anxiety that is associated with more diverse across a range of characteristics, not just race, but race stands out, I think, is that people feel less comfortable, less sure of who they are and what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to behave. And you know, you see that right now, actually, in the Me Too movement. Like, you know, a lot of men and women are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know what that was. I don't want to get in trouble, right? And that's a lot of what gets negotiated when people are new to diverse spaces, which quite frankly, most people are when they enter a diverse space, certainly when they go to college, but also any other diverse space because we live largely segregated lives still. And so having to go through that tough period, either you go through it, and I think actually people become stronger and more able to navigate on the other side. That's one of the known benefits of studying abroad to a country that's totally different from yours. You just develop these capacities to navigate intercultural difference in a way that you previously did not have. The same is true of being in a a truly racially diverse, equitable space. It's challenging. It's threatening. You don't know who you are, much less what you're supposed to say. But if you push through it on the other side, there's a competence to be developed and to be cultivated and to be cherished. And I think our nation has to decide whether it's going to push through or what normally happens, it retreats. We retreat to hunker down to what's comfortable. And, you know, it's not just the students of color who look for safe spaces. It's everybody who's looking for safe spaces. It's just the safe spaces for students of color and sexual minorities are marked in a way in part because it's not the rest of campus, right? It's not the classroom, which is majority, whatever your group is, right? And and so that's, you know, we sort of miss, you know, the broader dynamics of what's happening, but it's often similar across groups, everyone just trying to sort of grapple with what it means to be here and to be me, meaning my many identities in this space, and either pushing through it with goodwill and trying to navigate this, embracing this new challenge or not, you know, kind of running away from it, which, you know, I'm not saying is bad as wrong. It's just, I'll put it this way, it's certainly a common response. And I also get that. I think the conversation around safe spaces is so interesting. So Mm -hmm. uh, on a couple levels, first, that we have... In the most ridiculous way I can imagine, begun to pretend that safe spaces are something that other people want when mm-hmm. the, 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 the single most profound human desire is for safety <laughs> is to just to, like right. be able to be yourself and have no danger around you, no sense of threat. That's right. And, and the idea that, uh, as you say, like there are safe spaces that are visible when people are asking for them and then there are safe spaces that are visible when people are taking them away. And one of the things that I think that we have done in this conversation about safe spaces is that we're good at noting when somebody is asking for one, saying, hey, I wanted this to be a safe space. You were not supposed to be able to come here and interrupt that by telling me something I didn't want to hear. But then there's this other side where people get very upset when a space they felt was safe, like a classroom, say, is no longer a safe space for them to say whatever they want, for them to use you know, the gender pronouns they're most comfortable calling other people with or for them uh-huh. to say what they you know, want to say about race. And we get into a lot of conversations about free speech, which is wrong because it's not a constitutional protection issue. But I do think that we have erred in a way – by refusing to admit that people have a very deep desire for a safe space. And so a lot of this is people reacting to the discomfort and the anxiety and the threat and the anger and the shame of call-out cultures, of Twitter mobs, of feeling like you're a reasonably good-hearted person just trying to make your way in the world and all of a sudden people are on your back for something you didn't even understand. And I have to think one of the the better critiques of the left is that there's often very little sympathy in the reaction. People can come down on folks very hard, very fast for what can be honest mistakes or what can be sort of a, a lack of understanding or even just an honest disagreement. But on the other hand, it's somehow met by people who 
at the same time that what they desperately want is a safer space, is more space to just talk the way they've always talked and be who they've always been, they're mocking the desire for safe spaces on others. I think we'd have a much healthier political conversation if we admitted that we're all pretty deeply driven by senses of fear and desires for safety. And then when people are asking for this, they're not special pleading. It's just, it's how we all are. And just some of us have been able to take more of it for granted. That's right. And I think, you know, part of the issue is, especially in the classroom, where, you know, I talk a lot about these topics in the classroom, and I do really work hard to create a safe space for everybody to be able to engage it without that pile on. I mean, people are going to say things that sound offensive or even are offensive to me and to others in the classroom. Because, you know, research methods is is dicey. No, these are in my stereotyping and prejudice classes. And I think that you have to do that. We don't carve out that space for people who actually have not had an opportunity to think through these issues together, and some not at all. We don't carve out that space. And I mean, what is college campus supposed to do? I mean, you're supposed to learn stuff, I thought. (laughs) And learning how to do this and actually challenging, having your beliefs challenged and challenging your own beliefs and others is part of what we're doing. That's part of the work, thinking through all of this. And I think acknowledging that the very same space that is feels very safe for one person feels very threatening for another. The same space, right? There is no just space that's not curated that feels necessarily safe for everyone. And sometimes what has to happen is, you know, we got to democratize discomfort, right? We have to sort of lower the safety that some students feel, right? Sort of the unthinking safety that they felt and they didn't realize they felt it until it's sort of reduced a little bit in order to raise the feelings of safety and support and at least recognition of other students. And that's just true. That is just true. And it's part of I think the new reality, right? It is a new reality that when you have different constituents in your district or in your your different customers or different, you know, people to whom you are responsible, you need to think differently about the ways in which you engage them. But but let me turn this around because something that I see happen a lot and that seems to me to create a lot of resentment is there are young white men on campus and they feel threatened, you know, a reaction to something they say or to something they think or to something they believe or to an opinion they hold is intense and aggressive and they get shouted down or they get, you know, told they're racist or or whatever it might be. And one of the things that I I, I notice in this conversation is to be generous, I'd say a very complicated relationship that um, activists have to white fear. Right. There's an idea Uh that if you're sort of from a traditionally privileged group, you can't really be afraid or your fear is a little bit ridiculous or, you know, the the idea that you're the one who feels unsafe is absurd. But then the the subjective experience people have is very, very, very unsafe. Right. I mean, they're just a human. They don't feel strong. I mean, most of us are just terrified wandering around in these little bags of meat and (laughs) liquid (laughs) just trying to just trying to make our way in the world. And. And I wonder how you think about that, because as groups rise, particularly groups that have traditionally been treated quite poorly and and have had their concerns very marginalized, I think there's a very understandable tendency to say, I'm not here to worry about your fragility. I've finally been able to express what is hurting me. Now you're saying that like two minutes of this is too much for you. And on the other (laughs) hand, two minutes of it was too much for them. (laughs) And and I I, like that. That is a conversation. That conversation around fear is one that I think we have trouble admitting the idea that that, the people who have certain kinds of privilege can also have a lot of fear. And I think it's made this a very, very, very difficult space. Yeah, no, I I think that's right. And and that's why I go back to, you know, what you said. How do you engage this with kindness and patience and grace and respect, right? On both sides, right? It requires that on both sides, a generosity of spirit. I mean, and I'm talking about the Nazi who's coming for you, right? right. It's like, sorry, I have no generosity for you. Yep. But that's the rare situation, right? And actually I would love for somebody else to scoop him up and try to work it out for him. <laughs> just I just can't be on that duty. But, you know, I, I do think that we forget that, yes, we're all trying to work this out. And some of this is defensiveness to being called out or feeling uncertain or feeling scared. And I think that that's something that we have to grapple with. But we also need to remember it's not just 
white man who, although maybe they get constructed, you know, and then it's straight white man or straight Christian white, right? I mean, you, how many d- dimensions of diversity are you going to mm-hmm. go to? You find like the one people, set of people who actually don't, have never thought about this, right? So once you realize that actually for most of us, there is some dimension of social identity, which we are privileged, right? Meaning we are not discriminated against based on that characteristic or that identity. In fact, our lives are very easy. I mean, and right now, having a passport, a U.S. passport Right, I was going to say, you're born in America. Exactly. Once you grapple with, and I do this a lot in my classes, especially the ones that recruit a lot of students of color, and they're really, you know, motivated to talk about how bad it is for them and sort of go into a Prussian Olympics, (laughs) you know, and comparative victimization. I'm like, well, let's think about the dimensions of identity in which you have incredible privilege, being able-bodied, being Christian, being straight. You have all of this freedom to express that identity or not however you choose, without concern or fear, just walking through your daily life. Life is arranged for you. And I really work with them to think about themselves based on that identity and then develop a sense of empathy for the very people who are on the other side, the privileged side of the identities that are their sort of low status, more marginalized ones, the ones they want to talk about (laughs) in my classes, right? Because that's the thing, right? I mean, we're multiple. We have multiple identities. And we don't have to just really hunker into the ones in which we're sort of on the short and the stick, although we do that, you know, in order to galvanize activism. But we can also use that, both that side to have empathy for other similarly positioned groups across dimensions of identity. So other groups that are low status that we can identify with because of our own histories of marginalization. But we can also use our privileged identities, acknowledge them, one, to demonstrate what it looks like to acknowledge privilege, right? And not be, you know, ashamed of it. Just say it is so. And because it is so, here are the things that I'm enabled to do that actually other folks who are on the other side of this dimension aren't. What can I do to create a more just space just on that identity, right? And I think that goes a long way to, like, get to our sort of common humanity, right? Because that's the the reality, right? That's where we're trying to be. This is a good bridge back to something we were beginning to talk about early in the conversation, which is how do we frame all of this? So you you began talking about the problems you have with the very concept of majority minority America or majority minority California. Could could you go through those? <laughs> well, there are many. <laughs> One is that name. I just it drives me nuts. Like, what does majority minority mean? <laughs> right? You know, it's it's as if there are these racial groups, you know, all of the non-white Hispanics who are all the same, who we think of as minorities, but wow, look, they're majority, <laughs> right? That's just nuts. That doesn't make any sense. So that's that's part of the problem. Two, it sets up this majority minority, like as if this cut exists in reality, right? There is a force of non-white people who are coming (laughs) and they are working as a coalition to sort of overturn, you know, white people and whiteness. And then, of course, for many people, they hear America, Americanness, right? And so that's a problem. You know, well, and we know that's not true, right? There are any number of issues that these different groups have with one another that are certainly likely to play out before any kind of sort of common non-white coalition uh, developed, especially a political coalition. So, you know, so it's it's wrong and problematic. It also is unlikely to be true, right? These projections are based on decisions that people in the Census Bureau made about how to count, right? Once the 2000 census allowed people of more than one race to identify themselves as more than one race, then that was good. That was, a, a, you know, a, a political move that was embraced. And I certainly support it. And multiracial families really wanted this, right? But as we talked about the physics of this, you know, every action has a political reaction. (laughs) And one of the reactions, uh, at least, was, well, how do we count these people who are more than one race? Well, folks initially decided to count them as not white. So who said white and something else, right? You could choose to count them as whatever they said, and then you just have numbers that are more than 100%, but that's actually sort of reality because race is made up to begin with. But instead, they said, well, let's just count them as non-white. Well, if you count them as non-white, this is an ever-growing group in our nation. These projections then 
you get around the first is 2050, now it's 2042. Interestingly, it's getting pushed back a little bit because of changes in the laws and the economy getting bad and people having fewer babies. But it turns out it doesn't matter. If you just count them the other way, count people who are white in something else as white in something else, then the projections go far beyond, like a 2070 or something, right? And that's assuming everything stays the same. Who we count as white doesn't change. Who counts themselves, right? Census is mostly self-reported. Who counts themselves as white or not doesn't change, right? We have no reason to believe that that's going to be true. I mean, historically, who we decide as white versus other categories, that's always shifted, right? I mean, race is in part a political construction, and our politics can and do change it. And so I think given all of the anxiety that these projected changes are having, right, that outpace, we have pretty good data now, that the projected changes outpace the anxiety of actual demographic change in where people live, right? So given all of that, why keep doing it? Why keep putting out these projections that are unlikely to actually play out and certainly are probably wrong? So here's the other thing, though, that I think is interesting here, and you're the one who, who told me this. So we have the projections, whether they're 2042 or 2050 or, or, or whatever, for when America under this definition becomes majority minority. And then you ask people and they think it's already yes. happened. <laughs> and know. so something I think is pretty interesting here is that whatever the Census Bureau is saying, the experience people are having of the culture around them is that this has gone much faster. And, and, and after we talked, I went and looked at some of this data and I found that it was true among all groups. So it, oh, it yeah. was whites and African-Americans and, and Hispanics and Asians. Everybody thought that the demographic shift was happening much faster or had already happened than it actually was. And I thought that was interesting. There are all kinds of ways that we could try to talk about this. It is less threatening. And on the other hand, it made me wonder if that's then going to miss the point itself because people are experiencing it in, in a way that's threatening. They're experiencing it happening around them. I, I saw a study that said that when women are a third of a group, a lot of men think they're a majority. That's right. So there's this huge – like when, when you <laughs> see right. more of someone you're not, not as used to seeing in a, in a space, there's this that's huge right. overestimation of them. So I just – I wonder how much control we have over it. That, that's, I guess, what I'm asking. We can massage framing, but if, if people are, are this hypersensitive such that they're overestimating it by this much, <laughs> I wonder how much control we have to make this smoother. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a multi-pronged problem. I think part of the reason why people do have this anxiety about it is because of these projections, right, and the way it's framed. You know, recently we had that piece in The Times that came out about, you know, white social death or uh -huh. something like that, right? You know, and I mean, that is, I mean, there's a reason why we think it as, as sort of like, you know, headlines are always a little, you know, alarmist <laughs> relative to the piece. But if you, and I don't necessarily advise this, but if you look on any white supremacist website, all they talk about is white extinction, right? Cultural genocide. Right, white genocide. So they, right, they are using that language. So I don't think we want to embrace it in this cavalier way, right? So I think that's part of my concern about not just the census, although they have stopped, I should, should note, they don't necessarily calculate it that way or only that way, and they don't put out these projections anymore. They don't use the term majority minority. They have sort of changed their ways. But of course, this is happening all over media. And I think media figures need to think carefully about what it is they're saying, right? So diversity can be framed in a number of ways. And there is a, a part in which, yes, spaces are diversifying, and that's going to be uncomfortable for all people or parties involved. It's probably uncomfortable for the third of women <laughs> who were there in addition to the th two-thirds of men, right? It's, it's kind of comfortable for both. It was certainly uncomfortable for the, probably the one woman who was there for a long time, even though the guys felt really good about it. <laughs> so that is part of what diversity does. It's challenging. It's tough. But I think we, meaning media, one, we can push back on a misunderstanding of, one, what race is and how we think about it, but also our sense that either it means you're being discriminated against or something's wrong here. If a space is becoming more diverse, right, that is not true, <laughs> certainly. I mean, even if we just go by demographics change, that has to be become true, but also that it's bad, but also that it's something that should be just ignored as if it isn't new, different, possibly uncomfortable. I think acknowledging the discomfort actually goes a long way. I like to think about, again, with the student example, what's easier with students. If you 
found out tomorrow you had to have like a two-hour lunch with somebody from France had never been to the United States before. You've never been to France. You actually don't even speak French. You don't know what their language fluency is. You'd probably be a little anxious. You probably sort of would be worried. You might worry about messing up, especially if you found out that person thinks that sort of Americans are sort of boorish and, you know, not really that cosmopolitan. That would be stressful. You don't know how to do it. No one says, oh, you're, what, an anti-Francophile, <laughs> right? No one says that you're a bigot because of this anxiety. Yet that's exactly what we do when we say, okay, you, sh you have to have these interracial interactions. And, you know, I know you haven't had any before and probably you've only seen Black people on TV, but don't mess it up because that means that you're probably racist, right? I mean, it's horrible. <laughs> it's a horrible thing to do to people, right? So we can reframe what's happening in terms of people's experiences of diversity in, in ways that are more realistic. So here's where it gets very tricky, I think. So you, you have this, going back to the, the piece you wrote about how surveying this research and, and thinking about how America is going to navigate this transition, you and your colleagues wrote at the end, as a nation continues to diversify, the relevance of race, ethnicity, religion, and identity politics is likely to increase rather than fade. Indeed, it is entirely likely that some effort to assuage the identity threat and broader concerns of white Christian Americans is going to be necessary. But any efforts to do so will also need to avoid privileging the continued and guaranteed racial dominance of whites. And I read oh, that. That sounds great. And I thought, <laughs> I read that. I thought that is, I mean, politics is not that fine an instrument. And no, you've got <laughs> Bill O'Reilly and Rush Limbaugh talking and you have, you know, political coalitions that need to emerge. And you have a lot of people who, when they hear that right on the left, say, it is not my job to assuage the identity threat of white Christian America. I'm yeah. sorry you're not going to be the completely yeah. unquestioned. My, you know, like a lot of people hear that and it is intrinsically offensive to them. And then obviously yeah. you have the question of like, how do you assuage that threat? I mean, I read that and I thought that may be correct. <laughs> you laughed at me? I didn't laugh at you. I thought, oh, <laughs> we're screwed. <laughs> right. I, I read that and yeah. I thought because also in the writing, there aren't a lot of pronouns in here, but it's like, but who who's going to make this effort? Who has <laughs> <laughs> like who has the, the control of the dials here? And, and it yes, just made comfort me comfort of academia. When I <laughs> you just get to say when I look at the these coming decades and, and I don't want to be too, too grim about it because I'm actually not. I think compared to what we've been through as a country like this is totally manageable. I I as I said, I'm a Californian. I mean, California itself navigated this transition. It did not collapse into a hellscape of civil war. It's OK. Like, we can do this even if it's going to be tough and perhaps unpleasant. But it's a hard thing to imagine how we do it smoothly. And, and it makes me feel that periods like the one we're living in now with Trump and with, you know, constant fights or political correctness and just this kind of feeling of everybody at everybody else's throats – that, that that's what we're in for for a while. Uh, do, do you have a, a way to make me feel better about that, a way to make me feel less pessimistic? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn. Of the two of us, I'm more pessimistic. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I do acknowledge writing that. And I do think that that is essential, probably even more now than when we wrote it, because, you know, there's a time lag in these things getting published. And I think it's true. I am sympathetic to the, oh, I'm, it's not my job to assuage these concerns. And I am sympathetic to that, you know, especially because they're imagined concerns on one hand. But it turns out, you know, in, in our work, right, the, the way that we know that exposure to these shifting demographics in, in white Americans increases what we call group status threat or concern about the status of whites in American society is because when you basically add just a little bit to the articles about the shifting demographics, the majority-minority shift that says, but, you know, for the most part, the societal arrangements of racial groups in terms of wealth and political power is going to stay the same because these minorities are actually disproportionately young, there's disparate wealth and access to education, which is all true, right? So even when we flip to so-called majority-minority, power arrangements are not going to change overnight and maybe not at all. All the effects that we see, whether it's on racial attitudes or on these political um, policy endorsement questions, they go away, right? People are no longer shifting to the right in their political alignments. They're no longer expressing more racial animus. They no longer feel the need to defend the racial group, in this case, white Americans. And so we put that forward in some ways as a prescription because we know that actually works. 
or can work. <laughs> Let's put it that way, right? But, of course, the reason why we added that bit, but we can't say, don't worry, white people, you'll be okay, and you'll get to run everything forever, because that's not palpable, right? That's not acceptable. That's that's not okay, right? So it's almost a, we need to assuage this identity threat, maybe just by telling the truth for a little while, exposing the reality of wealth gaps, education gaps, you know, all of the, the truth about the actual relative standing of groups, political power, right? Just tell the truth as a first step and then try to create this vision of an America that actually is multiracial, multiethnic, multi-faith, that people feel that they have a stake in no matter what their identity is, right? I think that has to happen too, not just the inoculate the threat by just giving information about the truth about racial status. So, you know, that inoculate status threat, but also create a vision of a future America that actually is inclusive and people feel that they have a stake in. I think that is the closest thing I'm going to get to, to optimism here. So I'm going to I'm going to end us on that note. I always uh, end the podcast by asking the guest for three books on this subject, the, the subjects we're talking about, or any other that, that have influenced them that they would recommend to the audience. And so you got three book recommendations for us? Okay. Well, certainly, you know, this is where we are now in some ways is new, but some ways not new. So I, I think uh, White Rage by Carol Anderson is Past guest is on the show. That, she's great. Oh, she's, yeah, she's great. Um, an earlier version of sort of looking at this dynamic, not in the same way, but certainly from a political science perspective, uh, really interrogating the motives of the Tea Party is, it's old, but Christopher Parker and Matt Barreto's book on Tea Party politics and what it really meant to take your country back, as opposed to what the rhetoric about that was. That's great. And another great book that I enjoy, it just came out as Ryan Enos's a uh, book on um, oh, the space between us. The spaces between us. Yeah, a really nice look at race and geography and demographics as people live them, and how that's getting negotiated both personally and in people's politics. So, uh, so that's that's a quick three off the top of my head. They're all out on my shelf right now. <laughs> Jennifer Richardson, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Ezra. Thank you so much to Dr. Richardson for being here, to my producer, Jillian Weinberger, my engineer, Griffin Tanner. The Ezra Klein Show is a Vox Media podcast for production, and we'll be back. Production. Production. It's a production. We'll be back next week. <laughs>